bloodshed. People around the world are outraged by the horrors we are all witnessing. As long as we have abductees in the Gaza Strip, we have to go all the way. Brutality. Today, it is impossible to protect people. We are ready to use weapons, including any weapons. Amid escalating conflicts, how does the world avoid global disaster? Scripps News reports, stopping World War III. I'm Jason Bellini in Washington. If you're on edge, our leading intel and military officials say they are too. Our mission this half hour is to unpack the state of the threats we face, but also to explore what it will take to prevent World War III. I've just returned from the front lines, witnessing firsthand Russia's large-scale invasion of Ukraine, which began more than two years ago. It's safe to say that this is the most serious conflict Europe has seen since the Second World War. Okay, Julian, we have to go. I have to get down. I was on the ground in the days after the October 7th terrorist attack in Israel. That war between Israel and Hamas has predictably spilled over to involve Iran and its proxies. Iran has even attacked an American military base this past February in Jordan. After that attack, former President Donald Trump posted, we are on the brink of World War III. <laughs> then there's China. The quest to reduce tensions led President Xi to meet with President Biden late last year in San Francisco, and the two leaders talked just days ago. In the conversation, Taiwan. Biden wants to protect it. Xi sees it as China's. A potential flashpoint in progress. And the list goes on. North Korea. No talk since 2019 when Trump tried to win over the country's ruthless dictator Kim Jong-un. Now Kim has said, He's planning for war. That's where we are. And these threats are converging in a meaningful and frankly, terrifying way. Another critical intersection we are monitoring is the relationship between government of Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. This growing cooperation and willingness to exchange aid in military, economic, political, and intelligence matters enhances their individual capabilities and gives them each some insulation from external international pressure. We have people you'll want to hear from standing by from Tel Aviv to Brussels, where NATO is marking its 75th year of existence. The former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO will be joining us. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk Europe is at risk. The free world will be at risk, emboldening others to do what they wish to do us harm. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. Alex Miller is now with us from the United Nations. Let's start with Israel, Alex. Iran and its proxies, uh, the U.S. is defending Israel in the war, but also isn't blocking calls for a ceasefire in Gaza. Where's the thinking right now in the Biden administration? Well, particularly here at the United Nations, they know that they are walking a fine line. The U.S. knows it is Israel's strongest ally here at the U.N., particularly on the Security Council. It is its most consistent ally. But there are tensions that have continued to boil with uh, Washington and Israeli officials. We saw that abstention with the ceasefire in March. That ceasefire called for a ceasefire in, uh, during Ramadan, as well as the unconditional release of the hostages. That is as far as we have seen the United States go. They know that they have to continue to be an ally for Israel. But the reality here is that Hamas is not a member of the United Nations. So when a security resolution goes forward and is approved, it is binding, but it can't be binding if Hamas is not a member of the United Nations. So this is much more a messaging issue for the Security Council right now. And it's frankly, the United States really trying to be out in front to support Israel on this, but they don't have a lot of support with the rest of the United Nations on it. That's right. And it's pretty rare that the world gets to see daylight between Israel and the United States at the mm -hmm. United Nations. Between Israel and Hamas and Russia and Ukraine, you hear some people saying that there's the potential growing of a third world war. Uh, that's something the UN mm -hmm. was created to prevent. Uh, but almost 80 mm -hmm. years later, how strong is this organization itself to prevent the worst? 
I think over the last few years, you've really seen the strength of the UN tested here uh, at the Security Council in particular. We have obviously the war with Israel and Hamas, but also the war between Russia and Ukraine. When you look at the core members of the Security Council, their positions on the world are at odds. We have Russia and China with veto power going against uh, the Western countries that also have veto power. So you're really seeing these two perspectives go up against each other. There's also been criticism over the years that there aren't enough South uh, American countries involved in these decisions, African countries, some more Asian countries. There's really not the representation at the Security Council that I think a lot of countries would like to see. And these resolutions, when they pass, are supposed to be binding. But like you're seeing with the Israel-Hamas war, it is not necessarily being taken as seriously because you have somebody like a Hamas. So the, the UN really does need to evolve in some capacity. You look at the Human Rights Council here. There's been a lot of criticism with the Human Rights Council because some of the countries that have uh, been chairing the council have their own abuse allegations happening right now. And so all of these different entities have a lot of criticism of it. I think the, there just really isn't an appetite in the building from the powerful nations because, frankly, they have the power right now in allowing other nations to gain more power, those uh, South American countries, African countries, some uh, Asian countries, putting them on the Security Council as permanent members that would essentially diminish the power of these five core countries. Hmm, interesting. All right, well, Alex Miller, it's a complex area to unravel what's going on at the United Nations. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Let's go from New York to the Middle East. Sarah Coates is in Tel Aviv, Israel for us. Sarah, tit-for-tat strikes between Israel, Iran, and its proxies are alarming, but they're nothing new. Are you seeing any indications right now that the region is on the verge of an actual all-out war? Hello there, Jason. Certainly what is extremely alarming is this situation on Israel's northern border with Lebanon. Normally, the Israeli security establishment would not let one rocket in without an extremely heavy response. But what we have been seeing since October 7 are these daily tit-for-tat escalations between Israel and Hezbollah. And the real concern here is that an all-out war with Hezbollah uh, could certainly really drag this whole region into a wider conflict. We have been hearing uh, for the last few years threats from Hezbollah leaders to launch uh, what is believed to be its arsenal of 150 thousand extremely long-range, extremely deadly rockets into Israel. Hassan Nasrallah has been threatening to not only raise Haifa but also raise Tel Aviv where I am standing now. So this is of course of great concern and we do need to remember just how worried the Israeli security establishment actually is. This is why some 80,000 people who actually live in these northern communities are still vacated from their homes. They are not allowed to go back given the security situation there is so bad. Now, since October 7, uh, we also know, of course, that the United States has really bolstered its troop presence around the Middle East, including right around this region where we are here. And the other real threat here is that Iran is now vowing a response after this strike on that embassy, on that building in Syria last week, which claimed the lives of a number of senior officials, the finger being pointed at Israel. And there's a lot of fear that depending on this response, that it could drag the region into an all-out conflict. Jason. Uh, Sarah Coates reporting for us inside Israel. Thank you so much. I mentioned a moment ago NATO. It's marking its 75th anniversary, created as a security check on the Soviet Union. Now it's Russia. But with our support, Ukraine has pushed back, destroying or damaging a significant part of Russia's Black Sea fleet. Our correspondent, John Beaver, is in Brussels. John, 75 years is a lot of world history. Just orient us to start this conversation because we hear some mixed political posturing here in the States. How powerful is NATO right now? Well, I think NATO is only as powerful as its uh, member countries are and uh, how much they contribute to NATO. Remember, of course, NATO doesn't have its own army, so it is completely reliant 
on those NATO members uh, and what they bring to the table. Now, uh, for a long time, what we've been hearing about is this problem when it comes uh, to defence spending. The magic number is 2% of GDP being spent on defence. That is uh, the guideline that NATO is hoping for when it comes to its members. Remember, of course, that NATO uh, is all about what they call Article 5, and that says that an attack on one country is considered an attack on all NATO members. So NATO certainly has a huge army available to it because of its members, but in terms of the, uh, the funding, that is where some of the issues lie when we have have questions about the unity and the strength of NATO. Right. Well, we should note that a growing number of NATO countries are hitting that mark, that 2% mark, and are going to hit it this year. NATO launched in 1949 with 12 nations from Europe and North America. It's now the largest such alliance in the world. It's tripled in size, and it's at 32 members. More nations want membership, including Ukraine and Georgia. Do you expect to see future expansion to allow those nations in? Well, Russia has long said that NATO uh, expansion is an act of aggression. So that makes things very difficult when it comes to whether NATO should be any bigger. But that hasn't stopped NATO expanding uh, in recent months. Finland and Sweden, the most recent to join NATO. And NATO, uh, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, have uh, long been keen to point out that it is NATO members who decide how big NATO should get. And it's not uh, aggressors such as Russia uh, with threats that they make uh, that should decide how big uh, the organization is as a whole. Uh, when it comes to the admission of Ukraine, well, of course, NATO have said and have long said uh, that Ukraine will join NATO at some point. But when is the problem uh, there? In order to be a NATO member, you have to fulfill uh, certain obligations when it comes to things like defence spending. But also there are certain checks when it comes to things uh, like democracy and the judiciary that many people say that Ukraine um, hasn't, uh, it hasn't managed to get past those targets yet. You, of course, also have the added issue uh, of admitting a member country that is currently at war. So, of course, that would cause huge complications as well. But as you say, we also have other countries being talked about to join NATO. Uh, but some experts I've spoken to have said that now that we've had uh, Finland and Sweden join NATO, uh, that probably is it for the immediate future in terms of NATO expansion. It will, many argue, get bigger uh, one day. But certainly for now, uh, it seems that NATO has hit that magic number uh, and it is now facing this huge uh, challenge of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so NATO has very much got to deal with that in the coming months and who knows, maybe years. That's right. Huge challenge for a larger NATO alliance. Thanks to you, John Beaver, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your expertise. We have the perfect guest joining us now to talk about this. General Philip Breedlove is the former NATO Supreme Allied Commander. General, where would the world be today without NATO? Well, it's important to know that for 75 years, NATO has given us relative peace, certainly peace in terms of no world wars or major conflagrations of that size, but 75 years of peace on the European landmass. Uh, that now is being challenged, of course. So I would tell you that while the last 75 years have been incredibly important and NATO has done a magnificent job, NATO is more important now than ever before and the next 75 years will be an even bigger challenge. Hmm. General, you've flown combat missions abroad. Primarily, you flew those in the F-16s. That's the exact aircraft that Ukraine's been begging for. Uh, they may be getting some of them this summer. I know that there are pilots training on them right now. Uh, would that be a game changer? You've got Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway, Belgium agreeing to send 45 jets so far. Uh, what impact do you think they could have on this conflict? Well, certainly the F-16 is an incredible capability. And as you know, the F-16s that Ukraine will get may be older in terms of 
flying hours on the airframes, but they have been uh, upgraded along the way, midlife upgrades, looking at both their structural capabilities and their avionics capabilities. And so these will be very capable aircraft that Ukraine will fly. And all by themselves, they will make a difference. But, uh, you know, it's going to be over time because 45 airplanes are not going to arrive in the next several months. They will trickle in over the next several years as more and more pilots uh, are also trained over the next several years. So this is not going to be like a big boom where the F-16s arrive and everything change. But what is going to happen is this capability will begin to slowly grow and deliver for Ukraine. I, you think that a pilot can go from a MiG to an F-16 and training at last, let's say, six months a year and be good at flying it? How difficult is it to fly one of these? So I would tell you that F-16 pilots will tell you to fly the F-16 is incredibly easy. It's an, it's a, it's an amazingly forgiving aircraft. It, it's, its capability to just jump in and fly it around the flagpole is not very hard. What is hard about the F-16 is employing the weapon system because the, there are so many different modes and capabilities in this aircraft that learning to use them all well and remaining proficient on all of them is pretty tough. And so it will take time for Ukraine to master the weapon system of the F-16, but their pilots will learn to fly it very quickly. To learn to fly it very quickly, and we'll see what impact that this has on the war in months and years to come. General, we've got more questions for you, and we'll come back in just a moment to talk more about NATO and uh, the risks ahead for this world that seems to be so fractured. Back now to continue our conversation with retired Air Force General, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, General Philip Breedlove. General, this show's about stopping World War III. When you look at the threat environment out there, North Korea, Russia, China, the threat of escalation between Iran and Israel, what's worrying you the most right now? Well, that's a big question. And there are certainly many challenges in front of us in the world today. Every single one of them now has their eyes on Ukraine. Will the West stand by Ukraine? Is the West and is the United States a reliable partner that stands by its allies and friends? And so all eyes are on how we're going to handle Russia in Ukraine. And to that effect, you ask me, what should we do? The most important thing we should do is establish a real policy, a declaratory policy, a publicly known declared policy. We uh, often say in America, our leaders say, we're gonna be there for as long as it takes, or we're gonna give them everything they need. Both of these are incomplete sentences. We're gonna be there as long as it takes to do what? We're gonna give them everything they need to do what? And that part we have not declared. Well, big question is going to be who will be the one to declare it in terms of U.S. leadership? Uh, to what extent does our next president, presidential election in November matter in all of this in, in terms of overall global conflict? So the next uh, U.S. Uh, election will be impactful. Um, uh, both candidates leave big question marks. The current uh, administration has not given us a declaratory policy and does not seem to be uh, um, willing to do that at this point. They are deterred. They have taken counsel of their fears and listened to Mr. Putin's threats about nuclear exchange or widening the war or American soldiers dying on the battlefields of Europe again. And so they have not made a declaratory policy, and the world doesn't really understand where they stand. And then for do you the have other a, candidates... Can I ask you something? 
Sorry to interrupt you. I just want to ask you on that. I mean, do you have any sympathy for the situation they're in, trying to calibrate their response to Russia out of that fear that it could lead to thermonuclear war if things really get out of hand? Well, I'm glad that John Kennedy did not have the same fear because he faced an even worse challenge with nuclear weapons, possibly in Cuba. I'm glad that Ronald Reagan didn't fear the challenge when we were facing the intermediate uh, uh, range nuclear missile crisis in Europe and in Turkey and, and in Germany. We've had presidents in the past who have faced up to the same threats uh, that this administration is facing today, and they have made different decisions. That's certainly true, but uh, no doubt this is a very complicated, high-risk situation for the U.S. and right now the entire world. General Phil Breedlove, we appreciate your time. We're back in a moment. In our closing moment together, a simple statement. The world is a dangerous place. Any student of history or consumer of news today knows that. Ukraine, Russia, China, North Korea, the Middle East, flashpoints of conflict for generations, continuing into this one. Are we on the verge of World War III? You'd be hard pressed to find a serious expert that believes World War III is imminent. It's not inevitable, but it's also not impossible. And that makes our duty to stay informed, to elect leaders who take these threats seriously and to act responsibly all the more important. For our military and maybe for us, it's a matter of life or death. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Scripps News Reports. For now, reporting from Washington, I'm Jason Bellini.